Today we're going to go through 1 John chapter 1 per many of your requests after my video that I put out Friday talking about do Christians continue to sin after we get saved because 1 John chapter 3 verses 4 through 9 talks about it specifically verse 6 it says no one who abides in him keeps on sinning and no one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him this can be problematic and you know uh, difficult to understand for many people so we explain that if you didn't see that video i will link it below so that you can see it i described how john was um, trying to convey here that if we're in christ and we've truly been converted then we've left our lifestyle of habitual sin okay and that's what this passage is talking about this is not talking about sinless perfection as some take it to mean inevitably there were some critics in the comment that say yes this is talking about sinless perfection so we're going to hit on some of that today as we go through first john chapter one i'm going to show you why sinless perfection is a false doctrine, that it is dangerous, and that it's concerning. Um, but the Bible does not teach that at all. Sanctification is absolutely something that we're striving for, and total sanctification is the goal. But that does not mean that it's going to be achieved in this life, nor is it possible to achieve it here in this life. And I'm about to show you some scriptures that explains why. I also briefly just want to touch on our heart posture when it comes to sin and how we should look at sin and the law of the Lord, as well as briefly touch on the discipline of the Lord and how God deals with us when we do sin. So I hope you'll bear with me through the entirety of this video because these things are very important when we're talking about as Christians that we're going to sin again. This is an, an unfortunate thing. This is an inevitable thing. This isn't something that we revel in, rejoice in, celebrate in, and or have a nonchalant attitude towards, well, if we're going to sin again, then I'm not even going to try. No, that's not what I'm teaching. That's not what I'm saying. And that's not what the Bible teaches at all. So we're going to look at that and hopefully you'll walk away from this understanding 1 John chapter 1 more clearly and also understanding how as a believer, how we should look at and deal with sin. Okay, so 1 John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and which we have heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So you'll notice this is very similar to his opening in the Gospel of John. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, Blue Letter Bible that I'm using here gives some cross-references under the subtitle, which is really, really helpful. Um, but essentially, what is he saying here? He's saying, hey, I've been with Him. I've seen Him. I've known him. I touched him. I heard his voice. He taught us. We were under him and under his teaching. And I've come to you to testify and proclaim to you what he told me. That's what John is saying in his introduction here. He doesn't introduce himself like Paul does in his letters. But he's getting straight to the point. I like that. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. So this is a very similar opening. The Word became flesh. The Word of life, Jesus, became flesh, and we walked with Jesus. So we've been in His presence. We are eyewitnesses to all of this, and we're coming to tell you so that our joy may be complete. Now, who's he writing to? He's writing to Christians. And we see this very explicitly in the next chapter when he says, my my little children. Okay. So he's talking to believers and I'm going to show you in some other areas how we know that. If you have a study Bible, by the way, um, you know, a physical study Bible, a lot of times in the beginning of it, you know, it'll introduce um, the book of the Bible, the epistle, whatever it is. It'll tell you about the writer, the time period. Super helpful. If you aren't already reading that before you dive into a book of the Bible, I highly suggest you do. It will give you key themes. It will give you some literary characteristics of the letter or the writing or whatever it is and kind of help explain and help you understand what it means. And when you 
understand all this, this is what we talk about understanding the context of Scripture. It's not just reading the verses around it or the chapters or even the whole canon, but you're also getting into some of the cultural context and understanding as well, which just further illuminates the truth of God's Word, you know, and how we can apply it today. So just a side note before we continue. Okay. Can you tell this stuff excites me? <laughs> First John 1, 5 through 10. Let's look at this. Walking in the light. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. Heard from who? Jesus. That God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say we have no fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Okay, there's a ton of cross references we could look at here from the Gospel of John and from some of the other Gospels and even Paul. We're going to try to keep it tight in here for now. But uh, let's focus on our topic here, 1 John uh, 1, 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, the first thing I want you to understand is this isn't John just saying, hey, this is what I think. Remember, what is John saying? I was with Jesus. I heard him. I saw him. I touched him. He taught me, and I'm coming to proclaim to you the message that he taught us. And this is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you. So we have to hear these words as the words of Jesus. This is the message Jesus told them. So what did he tell him? What's a part of that message? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Okay, so we have to understand that. Another thing I notice about these three scriptures, and this is um, kind of addressing those who believe that sinless perfection is possible for now. Uh, This is another way we know that it's absolutely not possible here on this earth. John does not say, if you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. Is John a Christian? Yeah, John is a Christian, right? He includes himself in this. He says, if we say we have no sin, Christians, believers that I'm writing to, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, right? If we confess our sins, John includes himself in needing to be one to confess sins. John understands that he's going to sin at some point, and he has to continue in confession uh, confession of sins, right? If we confess our sins, he, Christ, is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, Christ, a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, we it, this is important. This matters. And then he goes on in the next um, chapter. We're just going to peek at the first verse. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay, so he makes it really, really clear. I don't want you to sin. We don't just accept sin we, in, in the sense of, oh, well, it's hopeless and we're not even going to try to live holy lives and according to God's word. Nope. And we're going to see more of that in the next chapter. Um, but what he's saying is that when we do sin, we have an advocate with Jesus Christ. He's uh, Paul talks about this in Galatians chapter 5. The spirit and the flesh are opposed to one another, right? They're constantly in opposition. And that's where he gives us some evident works of the flesh and then the fruits of the spirit. You know, I, I explained in my last video, I gave the example uh, briefly of me having road rage or something that I struggle with. And I, I do apologize if I came 
across as making light of sin. That wasn't my uh, intention whatsoever. Or if I made it sound like it's something that I just accept and know, and that's just who I am, and that's just what I do. That isn't my attitude, but rather I was trying to convey something, A, a little bit more lighthearted because my testimony is X-rated. I came from a life of drugs, sex, and rock and roll, and many of you probably haven't walked that life. I was in a band. I traveled all over the world, and I'm not going to project all the things I went through onto you guys and assume that you've dealt with the same stuff. So I tried to use something that more people could relate to and understand as simple as getting angry at other people on the road. Now, in doing so, it's something I've become aware of. You know, I repent of when this happened. And I know that in that moment, my flesh is rising up because Galatians 5 says that an evident fruit of the flesh is a fit of anger. So when you just have a fit of anger that comes out of somewhere like that, Paul says in Galatians 5 that that is our flesh rising up. And I know that in that moment, I'm not walking in the new man. I'm not walking in the spirit. And I say, God, forgive me. May I not do that anymore? And it's something I'm aware of. So I actively now when I feel that urge to get frustrated at somebody, I say, nope, I'm going to honor the Lord. Is it really that important? Do I really need to get there that much faster? And I, I'm serious. This is the way I think about it now. And I meant to share that in the last video, but you know, it got away from me and I didn't kind of button that up. So I'm not abiding and dwelling in that place of sin, of acceptance, and oh, that's just how it's going to be. And this is just a part of me. No, I don't believe that. I believe God wants us to be holy and we are striving towards total sanctification. That is the goal, but is it achievable in this life? No. And we're going to get to that in a second. But first, I want to, um, as I'm reading through this and as we are on the topic of sin and I'm chewing on 1 John chapter 1, we get into these conversations of, you know, well, what's sin? You know, let's define sin or is this a sin or is that a sin? And a lot of your comments is, you know, well, is this considered a sin and is that considered a sin? And we can tend to start to hyper focus on our sin. And what my pastor says, I don't know where he got it from. He calls it navel gazing, where we're constantly looking inward at ourselves, right? And we're not looking at Christ. We're not looking at outside to others and how we can be of service to other people and serve the Lord in that regard. But we start getting so hyper focused on our sin. And when we focus on it, it grows and gets bigger. And it's just like, oh my gosh, I'm so riddled with issues and so riddled with with sin. So in doing so, inevitably this came to mind is the scripture about the one who um, delights in the law of the Lord and meditates on his word day and night. And that we don't read scripture so that we can find out every little sin to make sure that we don't mess up. And that we just get so paranoid about sin. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's everywhere and I can't do this or I'm going to, uh, God's going to reject me and I'm going to go to hell. And guys, there's so many people that live their life under that paranoia. So I want to help you with that today according to God's word. And, I, and that scripture came to mind, Psalm chapter 1. I want to read you these first three verses. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does prospers. This is such a peaceful scene that David writes right here, and it's peaceful because there is peace in Jesus Christ. He is not writing this as blessed as a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of Scott. You, you know what I mean? It's not this like, oh, how dare you don't do this or else, which is how many of us see God's word sometimes. And not to get into a different topic, but this also depends on how you see your own father and how you were raised. The way you see your father and the way your father interacted with you is likely a version of how you see God. We're going to talk about that in a future video, but depends. Maybe some of you didn't have a father in your life. That affects how you see God. So what God is doing through his word is he's showing us this is who I really am and what I'm really like. And sometimes we project our personal life experiences into scripture rather than uh, just allowing them to speak to us and, and understanding who God is through his word. So what David is doing here, he says, but 
His delight, talking about the righteous man, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This has not always been me, guys, but God is uh, developing this in me, and I know he's developing this in some of you, where I meditate on God's word day and night. I'm thinking about these scriptures. I'm chewing on these scriptures. I'm thinking about 1 John chapter 1. I'm thinking about 1 John chapter 2 and 3, and really the whole book, because they all kind of run together, and you're going to see that as we get more into it. But I love God's word. I've grown to love it. It's no longer boring to me or hard to read, but I've... uh, I've developed a heart for it. And once you learn that God's word is God's um, manual to us that shows us his nature, Jesus is the word made flesh, right? So Jesus came and he walked out all of these things that we can read in God's word, these characteristics, who he is, what he loves, what he hates is in God's word. And it made me think about 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, the Lord's covenant with David. And this is basically where he tells him that Solomon's going to be the one to build the temple and not to get into it too deep. But I want to explain this with you. David had just come home from war. And he's sitting there in his home. He's probably tired, probably exhausted, but God had gave him all these victories in this battle. And he's looking around in his house and he says, I have this house made of cedar, but the ark of the Lord is in a tent. And then he talks to Nathan. And he says, I'm going to build a house for the Lord. And basically telling Nathan, the prophet, go seek God on this. And God comes back and says, no, David, I don't want you to build a house, but I'm going to build you a house, David. It's your son Solomon that's going to build the temple. Why does this matter? This tells us David's heart posture, and this is what I'm getting to with this when we're you know, dissecting what is sin, what is not sin. David's heart posture was, God, how can I please you today? Most of us would come back from serving God like that or accomplishing something great and say, I deserve pleasure. I deserve to be treated. I deserve a reward. I deserve something for all the good stuff I just did. But instead, David's heart which meditated on God's law day and night. He's sitting there thinking about the heart of God. That's why it says he had a heart after God. He pursued him. He loved him. He was in love with God. And he says, how can I please you, God? I want to build you a house, God. I don't need you to reward me for everything I just did. I see the victories as the reward. And now I want to please you. So we read God's word to learn what God loves, to learn what God hates, so that we're saying, Jesus, I want to keep your law his commandments are not burdensome. Also in 1 John, we're going to get to that. But I want to obey. I want to keep your law because you did come and die. Humble yourself as a man. You came to serve, not to be served. You put that garment around your waist and got down and washed feet. You went to the cross for me. You went to the cross for the world. And because of that, I want to read your word. I want to meditate on it day and night. I want to study all of the things you love and all of the things you hate so that I know, God, how I can walk in them and how I can please you and please your heart. Sin becomes loathsome to the one who loves Jesus. And it's because in that moment, you're choosing not to walk and live your life in a way that pleases Him, but that it pleases and serves yourself. We choose to step outside of allowing God to be in control of our life to wanting to control our own life ourselves. It's that simple, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but either we're living to please God or we're living to please us. So John tells us here that we're going to sin at some point. And when we sin, to put it in its simplest form, like I just said, it's when we choose to live for ourselves, to please ourselves, to take control of a situation for ourselves. And we often step outside of that belief and trust in the Lord. We're trying to please the Lord and we're trying to do something for ourselves, which is most of the time an evident work of the flesh. So when we read God's word, may we have the heart posture of, God, how can I please you today? We're learning about Christ. We're learning about what he did for us. We're learning about his character, his nature, who he is. You know, Jesus was a real person who walked and talked and ate and slept and drank, and he told jokes, and he was funny, and he had friends, and people liked him. 
It's true. He was a real person and he's still alive today. He's not just some character, this like invisible person in the sky, guys. He's somebody that we're actively pursuing to please every single day of our lives. So do we pursue holiness? We absolutely pursue holiness out of that place of God. I want to please you. We're going to see more of this in 1 John chapter 2, but anyone who says, I know him, but doesn't keep his commandments is a liar. Yes, we're in Christ, and yes, we fail, but we run rapidly to the feet of Jesus in rapid repentance, and we confess those sins, and it says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. We have been sanctified, but we are being sanctified, and we're going to be sanctified. We have been saved, but we are being saved, and we're going to continue to be saved. These are the Greek tenses of the word. This is what it says. Romans chapter 3 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That word fall is also active, meaning you've fallen, you're falling, and you're going to fall. But we've been sanctified and saved. We're being sanctified and saved. And we're going to continue to be sanctified and saved. And we receive the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ every single day as we pick up our cross, deny ourselves and follow him. So I hope this helps you see that we're not living a lifestyle that embraces sin, but we hate it because God hates it. And we turn from it because of what Jesus did on the cross. And if you've ever watched this channel or my videos, then you know that I'm always talking about the pursuit of holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I'm always talking about keeping the commands of God out of a heart to please Him, not to be saved, but because we are saved. But we err if we believe that total sanctification is accomplished fully here in this life. Just simply looking at something like Hebrews chapter 12 that talks about the discipline of God real quick, and then we'll close the video. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline and all which have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. This actually says that if you don't have the discipline of God in your life, if you go on sinning, 1 John chapter 3, 4 through 9, if you do go on sinning and there's no consequences, there's no discipline, nothing happens, there's no conviction, then you're actually not a Christian. That's what this means. And we're going to get more into this, uh, the discipline of God in a future video, in a dedicated video, because there's so much to it. But this says you're illegitimate if you don't experience God's discipline. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us, again, coming from a writer that is a Christian, including themselves. He disciplines us as Christians. This is written to Christian Jews for our good, that we may share in his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained for, who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight the paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So, when we read this, we see that God disciplines the ones He loves, His true children. I'll point this out quickly. First Timothy 1, 
Verse 15, Paul says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. Paul still says, I am the chief of sinners. We've heard that before. Paul says that. Romans chapter 7, he talks about the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do are the things I do. Okay? So Paul says, I sin. And lastly, I want to share with you Philippians 3, where Paul is talking to them and he's saying, hey, be found pure and blameless in the day of the Lord. That is the goal. Peter talks about this, you know, to be found spotless without blemish, that bride, to be blameless before God, um, the holiness with which out no one will see the Lord that we should be striving for, that we just read in Hebrews. This is absolutely the goal. We should be striving towards this place of pleasing God and by doing what He loves, by keeping His commandments. God is in pursuit of us, but we're also in pursuit of Him. That's what abiding is. We abide in Him. He abides in us, John chapter 15. But look at what Paul says in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this. What's he talking about? Sinless perfection. Not that I've already obtained this, or am I already perfect? But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul is striving for a life that is sinless, but he's admitting, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect, but that's the goal, and I'm straining towards the goal, and that is our goal as believers today. We're not perfect, no, but we have an advocate in Jesus Christ when we sin, and we run to Him in rapid confession, rapid repentance. We turn and we put it behind us. We don't make it our pet sin. Some things we deal with, like I said in the last video, it's a process. Sometimes we need to involve pastors, leaders, counselors, people to help us put accountability in our life and set up practical things in our life to help us to stop habits that our flesh have formed, right? So there's certain things that need to be broken spiritually in deliverance and demonic strongholds. There's different elements that come into play with really tough and difficult sins that we deal with. But the goal is that we strive towards pleasing God, God's heart. Yes, we sin, but we don't embrace it. We don't hold on to it. We don't make it our pet. We don't welcome it. Any of that. We hate sin and we put it behind us and we say, God, I thank you for your saving grace. And Jesus, you are my righteousness. He that knew no sin became sin so that we could become sons of righteousness. Hallelujah. One of my favorite scriptures. So I really hope this helped you out today and that this brings some more clarity. I know we discussed a lot more than 1 John chapter 1, but because it was only 10 verses, I thought we would take the opportunity to share some of these other topics as we go deeper into the book of 1 John. We're going to start chapter 2 next, and that one's probably going to have to be broken up into a couple of different videos because there's a lot going on there. But anyways, I hope this was helpful for you today. If you're not a part of our Patreon and you would like to join our Patreon, I'm going to start posting some of these Bible studies over there and probably doing some additional Bible studies as well. You can support the channel monthly financially if you would like to do so on Patreon and through Patreon, but you don't have to. It's free to join and uh, all donations are appreciated, but never required. And the links for those are in the description as well. But if you're not subscribed, I would truly appreciate it. It does help the channel out and ask that you would hit the like button. That's the thumbs up button. And that tells YouTube to send this video out to more people. But anyway, thank you so much for watching today and I will see you in the next one.